this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of the Train Family Police Murders that occurred in Queensland, Australia in December 2022? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Stacy and Nathaniel Train met at a Baptist church in Toowoomba, Queensland, Australia. Nathaniel's father worked at the church as a pastor. Stacy and Nathaniel married when Stacy was 18 years old. They worked as teachers and had two children. At some point, Stacy divorced Nathaniel and married his brother, Gareth Train. Perhaps she viewed her marriage to Nathaniel as a train wreck and believed that Gareth represented a gravy train. Unfortunately for Stacy, she was on the wrong side of the tracks. Later in the story, it becomes clear that Stacy should have looked for somebody with the last name of car, plane, or boat, anything but train. Even with Stacy gone, Nathaniel was able to keep on track and continued working as a teacher and principal in Queensland before eventually moving to Walgett, New South Wales, and finding a job as a principal. By the early 2010s, Stacy was living with Gareth in a small settlement about 90 miles north of Brisbane. She was a teacher there. In 2011, Gareth and Stacy moved to Camelwheel, a town with about 200 residents in western Queensland that borders the Northern Territory. Gareth's behavior in this town was disturbing to the residents. For example, he was described as a control freak who would attack Stacy. On one occasion, he was seen dragging her upstairs by her hair. Gareth would use his dogs to hunt boars. People would hear the boars screaming as Gareth stabbed them. He would hang the carcasses up in his backyard, which was adjacent to his school. The stench was unbearable. Gareth's driving behavior also attracted attention. He would drive by residents at 60 miles an hour as if he was going to hit them, sometimes coming within inches of striking them. He was like a runaway train. In 2015, after receiving numerous complaints, the couple moved two hours away to the city of Mount Isa before purchasing a 106-acre property on Wayne's Road in the small town of Weambilla. This is about 950 miles southeast of where they lived. The town is about 250 miles west of Brisbane. In 2016, Stacy took a job as a principal at a local school, but she was the target of many complaints. She left that job in May of that year. Years later, Stacy found another job at a school in the town of Tara, about 40 miles south. Stacy resigned from that job in December 2021. At some point around this time, Nathaniel Train, who was both Stacy's ex-husband and Gareth's brother, was reported missing by his family. He suffered a heart attack in August of 2021 and became profoundly interested in religion and conspiracy theories. He was also very angry at the New South Wales educational system for allegedly not supporting him after he had his medical incident. He developed a one-track mind. He was obsessed with their alleged wrongdoing. Gareth and Stacy also had become heavily invested in conspiracy theories and had made disturbing posts on social media. Nathaniel left New South Wales and made his way to the property where Gareth and Stacy lived in Weambilla. It's not clear if he lived in the house with them or was camping somewhere on their property. Gareth and Stacy considered Nathaniel to be a whistleblower who was trying to expose corruption in police departments and in the New South Wales educational system. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On December 12, 2022, at around 4.30 p.m., four police officers from the Queensland Police Service visited the Train family residence in Weambilla. They were paying the family a visit for three reasons. One, Nathaniel Train had crossed the border into Queensland from New South Wales despite being unvaccinated for COVID-19. Two, there was an outstanding warrant related to Nathaniel dumping firearms at the border and three, the missing person report that Nathaniel's family had filed about him. The police officers met at the entrance to the property, but the gate there was locked. They jumped over the gate and proceeded toward the house. At 4.45 p.m., as they were walking on the property, Gareth and Nathaniel opened fire 
on the officers. Two officers, Rachel McCrow and Matthew Arnold, were wounded by gunfire and then killed at close range. An officer named Randall Kirk was wounded, but he made it back to his vehicle and drove away to get help. The fourth police officer, Keeley Bro, hid in the tall grass. Gareth and Nathaniel set fires in order to force her out. She texted the police and her family. She asked the police for help, and she told her family goodbye. Two neighbors saw the fires and investigated. One of them, Alan Dare, was shot and killed by the Train family. At 5.15 p.m., other officers arrived and rescued Keeley. At 6.34 p.m., Gareth sent a text message to his daughter telling her that people had been sent to kill them. At 7.39 p.m., Gareth and Stacy posted a video featuring their faces in low-light conditions. Gareth said, quote, They came to kill us, and we killed them, unquote. He then referred to the police as devils and demons. At 9 p.m., a special emergency response team arrived at the property. At around 10.30 p.m., they shot and killed Gareth, Nathaniel, and Stacy. In the end, six people had been killed during the incident, two police officers, a neighbor, and all three members of the Train family. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. The three members of the Train family maintained a series of unusual beliefs. Most of what is known about these beliefs come from Gareth, but it's clear from a diary that Stacy left behind that she shared his beliefs. Nathaniel was also heavily invested in conspiracy theories. Here are some of the beliefs of Gareth Train. He believed that COVID-19 was a sign of the end times, for which he was preparing in many ways. He considered himself to be a survivalist. Gareth was convinced that the 1996 Port Arthur massacre was a false flag operation designed to strip away gun rights in Australia. He believed the police were harassing him. He thought they were using aircraft to spy on him, were planning on kidnapping him using contractors, and intended on murdering him and his wife. He was convinced the police were targeting who he referred to as truthers and conspiracy talkers. Gareth was anti-vaccination, considered himself part of the sovereign citizen movement, and was worried about biowarfare, toxins, artificial intelligence, and drones. He was quite upset about the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, convinced that she was murdered in an occult blood sacrifice. Gareth once posted that compliance turned people into soulless, spiritless, demonic meat suits. I presume he was not a fan of demon-inspired apparel. Gareth was convinced that there were re-education camps in Australia that people would get to by government-operated trains. In reality, the only train people should have feared was Gareth train. Item number two. All three members of the train family were considered Christian fundamentalists. They believed in premillennialism. This is a literal interpretation of Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, which describe the millennium. It talks about how some people will be resurrected first, and these people will be priests of Jesus and reign with him for a thousand years. Most Christian denominations believe in amillennialism, which means the millennium is symbolic and is occurring right now. At the end of the symbolic millennium, there will be the second coming of Jesus and the Last Judgment. Those who invest in the idea of premillennialism believe that the order of major religious events will be the Tribulation, the Second Coming, the Millennium, and then the Last Judgment. The authorities in Queensland have suggested that premillennialism was tied into this attack, like this belief of the Train family inspired them to commit acts of violence. Premillennialism does not have any association with violence it's really just about the order of major religious events. It is not a popular belief among Christians, but it is far from radical or dangerous. There has never been a terrorist attack based on premillennialism. Believing it was responsible for an attack would be like equating the belief in transubstantiation with violence. There is nothing about those constructs that connects to violence in any way. Item number three. The authorities have suggested that the attack at Weambilla was premeditated like the train family lured the police in order to attack them. The police said that there was evidence of planning, like barriers constructed of logs and dirt, surveillance cameras, mirrors on trees, and a trap door under the house. 
I don't think that the Train family set a trap. All those items more strongly support the idea that they were paranoid. In addition, not long before the attack, Gareth posted on social media warning the police to stay away. I believe that Gareth viewed the police as the enemy and thought they were coming to get Nathaniel. In his mind, when the police jumped over the gate on his property and started walking toward the house, this confirmed that they were demons intent on destruction. Gareth did not need a lot of provocation to believe in a fantastical explanation. Item number four, the We Ambilla murders have caused a lot of controversy as far as how they should be categorized. Some people have said that the Train family members were terrorists trying to promote a Christian fundamentalist ideology. This position maintains that the attack should be thought of as terrorism. No mental health factors were involved. Others have viewed this case and come to believe that the family members were probably mentally ill. There is no reason to believe that they had any connections to terrorism. This position maintains that labeling them as terrorists is just a way for the public to avoid experiencing fear and trepidation about the dangers and randomness of delusional beliefs. There's actually some comfort in the idea that the train family members simply made a decision. It removes uncertainty from the equation. People think it could never happen to them, like they would never do that themselves, because they would never make that same choice. This is a familiar debate when it comes to attacks that can be connected to terrorism. It is the extreme belief versus delusions debate. One could view this controversy as being about someone choosing to commit murders or being compelled to commit murders by delusions. It's really about responsibility. Extreme beliefs do not free somebody from responsibility for a violent act. But if someone is truly delusional, it becomes more difficult to argue that they intentionally carried out a crime. The problem with this particular debate is the lack of any clear way to resolve it. In the world of mental health assessment, there is no reliable way for differentiating extreme beliefs and delusions. However, there are a few factors that a clinician can consider when making an evaluation of a person who committed a violent act ostensibly based on an unusual belief. For example, is there a mental health history? Are there any prodromal symptoms of a disorder associated with delusions? Does the person have narcissistic characteristics like grandiosity? Do they have a lack of empathy or lack of insight? To what degree do they hold the unusual belief? And are they emotionally invested in the belief? Even when weighing these factors, again, it's difficult to determine if somebody has extreme beliefs or delusions. There is no way to know with any level of certainty. Item number five, what do I think happened in the case of the Train family? This is just a theory, my opinion. Members of the Train family were highly functional for many years especially Nathaniel and Stacy. Gareth started having unusual beliefs during his long periods of unemployment. He did have a few jobs. For example, in 2009, he was a child safety support officer for two months, but he was often unemployed. No one was interested in hiring Gareth. He started spending a lot of time studying conspiracy theories online, and he went off the rails. I think Gareth may have developed something like delusional disorder. This is a disorder where a person develops one or more non-bizarre delusional thoughts, meaning they believe in situations which are technically possible, but everyone knows those situations are not really happening. A large government conspiracy is a good example. It could happen, but it's probably not happening. There are a few other elements of delusional disorder that align with Gareth's behavior. For example, most people who suffer from it function very well in most areas of their lives. The delusions are restricted to some degree. They don't necessarily take over the person's life. The disorder causes unusual interpretations of actual events. The delusions change as new events occur, like the delusion gets updated when new information becomes available. COVID-19 would be something new that happened in Gareth's life that appeared to change his way of thinking. He was able to update his delusions with the COVID-19 pandemic. And people with this disorder almost always retain their planning skills. Gareth may have developed both grandiose and persecutory delusions. He believed that he was special, great, and destined for some type of religious glory, and he thought people were out to get him. Stacy could have developed delusions as part of shared psychotic disorder, which I've talked about many other times in other videos. 
This is when delusions are transmitted from one person to another, almost always when the people are in close proximity. Nathaniel's symptoms could be explained through a shared genetic component with Gareth and or through shared psychotic disorder. Now moving to my final thoughts. I find it interesting how after attacks like the one at Weambilla, some people immediately declare that they know the cause. The reality is that the true cause of the murders may never be known. Whether the cause was extreme beliefs or delusions, it's clear that many people have developed a fear of the government. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic caused so much stress that many people who were on the edge of extreme beliefs or delusions were pushed over into a world of nonsense. Those are my thoughts on the murders at William Billa. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.